ideas. So um, I would like right now like to share with you um, the all you know Tanzania as a, a destination to to visit, as well as uh, we discussed and talked about uh, you know having uh, another experience in our neighbor country Kenya and Rwanda, especially for gorilla trekking, as well as in Kenya to see the cross migration. So as uh, Eric said, we'll be having uh, one tour in Tanzania in the end of May next uh, 2025. And uh, the next one will be in September next year, which will be Rwanda, go to trekking, as well as uh, um, uh, world of uh, migration in, in, in Masimara, as well as see the land and everything. So just to proceed, um, uh, as you can see on the map here, uh, this is where I mean, the region is, is way in the uh, eastern part of Africa. And uh, the next map here, you can see um, it shows uh, the Tanzania down here, which is almost uh, the double size. Uh, it's uh, the double size of uh, um, uh, California. And then we have Kenya here, almost the size of Texas. And if you go further on the left, you see a little small country uh, called Rwanda, uh, which is almost the size of uh, Maryland, one of the smallest uh, um, states in America. So in this region here, this is where This is where you got to see most of the um most of the animals actually uh, we're talking about over twenty five percent of the uh, wild animals in Africa are based in this region of the Africa so that's where the tour is going to be so there's so many attractions to be seen in uh, this region and one of it is in Gorongoro Crater which is in the Gorongoro Conservation Area uh, which is the only unbroken caldera in the world with animals in it which I'll share to you uh, in the next uh, slideshow. And uh, the Oldupai Gorge, where they discovered the, the human being fowl. So I'm sure you heard about the leakies in the sky. So this is where it happened. And the youth, this is in Tanzania side. And of course, Mount Kilimanjaro, the only freestanding mountain in Africa and the tallest mountain in Africa. So um, a part of it, some people climb it, but you know, you can have a good view of it from, from uh, from uh, the lodge or from the national park. And of course the Great East Africa migration, which real makes people to come to see. Um, this is the only remaining, actually, uh, in terms of the big animals uh, uh, in the world. Uh, there was, you know, bison here in America, you know, it happened what happened. And then there was a uh, cop antelopes in Uganda. It, again, it uh, uh, it's no longer there. So this is, this is the only remaining. And uh, this uh, great uh, migration we're talking Talking over four million animals migrating in the, in the into that region of uh, northern Tanzania and then southern part of Kenya, and the culture. You know, people comes in Africa basically, you know, to see the big uh, game, but. Uh, culture, this uh, part of the world, uh, Africa continent is enriched in terms of culture. Like in Tanzania itself, we're talking over 125 different tribes. In Kenya, almost 43 tribes. In Rwanda, they have one main tribe, which is uh, Rwandese, you know, I'm sure you heard about Hutus and Tutsis, but they're all Rwandis. They all speak the same language. And, uh, you know, get an experience of going to these uh, authentic cultural villages and uh, interact with locals and as well as visiting the schools. So it's part of it. And some people prefer, after the main tour, seeing all these beautiful animals, they go to the Spice Island of Zanzibar. Uh, this is where they get the beautiful beaches you, you named. You know, uh, it's more than what you can imagine. And of course, it's very historical there. If you love history, um, and they have a beautiful uh, stone town, and as well as uh, they have uh, spices which they were introduced in by the Arabs those years, years back. Uh, that's why it's called Spice Island. So speaking of the Ngorongoro crater. Uh, the Ngorongoro crater, it is one of the, uh, uh, you know, of its own kind, you know, as it uh, says there, there are almost 25,000 large animals living down in a caldera. And as I said before, it is the only broken caldera, unbroken caldera in the world, which means, um, according to scientists, it used to be a taller mountain than Mount Kilimanjaro of today, which is, you know, Mount Kilimanjaro is about 19,000 feet. And the first time it erupted, and the second time it collapsed and formed that huge, like a Benson kind of um, uh, formation. So in there, in order to go in, you have to descend, and, you know, by using, uh, we have a special extended land cruisers, Toyotas, which are designed 
designed specifically for doing the safaris going in there. And to get out, you have to ascend this and another road, you know, like a big anaconda kind of office, which is quite very interesting. So in there, it's over 110 square miles. And then that's where all those animals live. We call this um, a beginner's park. That's, you know, because you got to see everything in, in, in one place. So talk about wildebeest, zebras, rhinos, lions, hyenas, flamingos, gazelles, you name it. And of course, we normally spend almost the whole day there and enjoy the game drive and have a picnic in there and life goes on. Yeah, so uh, that's part of the experience. And then uh, the old Dubai Gorge. So this is where they discovered uh, the human being fossils. And then we normally detour when we are getting out of the Ngorongoro heading to Serengeti. Uh, we do two there. It's like uh, less than three kilometers, I don't know exactly in miles, and uh, stopping there. And you know, they've got a beautiful museum, and then you'll be lectured, uh, uh, have a nice talk about why that place, all those they found, uh, the fossils, and then after that, proceeding to Serengeti. So, and uh, of course, Mount Kilimanjaro. The only standing mountain uh, in Africa, and uh, uh, the name Kilimanjaro it it means the mountain of God, and you know we Africans uh, before uh, the foreigners explorers came down, uh, we had our own way of believing. So the mountain like this Mount Kilimanjaro in the middle of nowhere with a white cap, uh, people said, oh this must be a mountain of God or our God's representative. So that's the meaning of the white Kilimanjaro, and of course we have another mountain like Old Nyulingai. It's a Maasai word. Uh, which means the mountain of God is again. So all the northern guys does not have a snow cap like Kilimanjaro, but that one um, it's a still active volcano. Uh, it erupted, reacted, uh, erupted like a few like three four years ago. So the people in that area, the Maasai people, you know, they don't believe in science into this uh, high heat and pressure. You know, uh, that's how. For it made that formation to happen and uh, and the lava or ashes came out comes out uh, for them it's like uh, uh, God is unhappy so that's been named the God of mountain of God as well so till when the explorers came uh, they brought the Christianity and uh, of course the Arabs came and brought the uh, Muslim uh, that's when uh, we started believing the other way but some people still keeping their traditions way of believing yeah so. For those you know who cannot climb it, you know, you know, you drink it, you know. There's uh we got a Kilimanjaro beers and Kilimanjaro water. And nowadays we have even a Kilimanjaro wine. So it's just your choice uh to do that. I mean, it and it's a part of our program actually. We don't climb, but we'll have these other experiences. Yeah. And um speaking of the uh, great uh, migration of wild beasts and zebras migration in the Serengeti ecosystem. There's something I can talk about it in a couple of hours. Uh, it's something you got to see it. Uh, and it's so quite very amazing. And this is all year round. It just depends on where you are and what you want to see. Like for the May groups, uh, end of May, June, that's the ratting season, that's a mating season. And that's the time we'll be seeing them moving from central part of Serengeti heading to Western Serengeti towards the Gurumeti River and um, Balagate River. And um, of course, uh, besides other animals we'll be seeing, um, lots of uh, elephants, uh, gazelles, giraffes and everything. But it's, this is part of the highlights. And for the September, when we do the gorilla trek, that's the second group uh, tour, after doing the gorilla in Rwanda, then we'll be going um, to northern, uh, sorry, southern Kenya uh, at Masai Mara Game Reserve. And that's the time when this world builds will be, most of them will be already across the border and entering in the Kenya side and you'll be able to see crossing the Mara River. So seeing if you've seen in documentaries or National Geographic uh, animals, uh, you know, uh, stampeding themselves crossing the river, that's what's uh, happening in September and in October. So we'll be, get, be there in uh, early September or between, you know, as I said, we'll be living here on the 3rd uh, of September. So in between, uh, that's the best time to see this. So uh, why are they migrating? There's the reasons, uh, different reasons make them to migrate. There are about four main uh, reasons. One is water. 
uh, wild beasts and zebras, they're water dependent. So, so um, they're going to go, they follow where the rivers are. Like when they leave southern part of Serengeti, they go to central Serengeti. There's a lot of rivers there, uh, Serenera River. Then they go to western part of Serengeti where there's uh, a Grumet and uh, Malaget River. And then another group heading north where they go to Mara River. So that's one of the reasons that makes them to, to move from one place to another. But this does not mean that all of them get a chance to drink water because when they get to the river, sometimes being scooped, maybe there's a lance uh, on the side of the river or the crocodiles there in the water. And then right after they, you know, they got there and then be scooped up, that's it. That's it for that day. They just move around. And uh, sometimes there's a little bit of um, uh, late evening showers and then they get a little moisture from the grasses and then they survive that way. So that's reason, reason number one. Number two, they, um, they, because of the number, they, they eat a lot. They need food, so they cannot stay in one place. Otherwise, uh, they change it to be desert. So they keep uh, moving, looking for the grasses. According to the people who did some kind of research, they said uh, this number of wildebeest, over 2 million wildebeest, uh, and of course, about almost about a million uh, zebras, they eat almost a f uh, four tons of grasses a day in, in number, not one, though. Um, so by doing that, that means... Um, they 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 poop a lot, you know. So, but by doing that, they just manure the soil. So you get the food in front, but you gotta take care of the soil. So they keep moving from one place to another, you know, because of looking for the food as well. And the third reason is a place to give birth. Um, all these wild bees, and uh, as I said, it's all year round. Um, uh, migrating depends on where you are or where they are. Uh, in June. In June, July, that's the time you'll be uh, coming for the first group, which you're going to do only Tanzania. Um, that's the rotting season. That's the mating season. And they keep going north. When they're north, uh, mid-August, uh, mid, uh, uh, that's most of them, they already met and like that, like that. And then November, that's when they turn back and come to the southern part of the Serengeti. As you can see on this little map here, um, they come way down. To, uh, to way down. As you can see, the map goes around. Uh, you can see them uh, moving this, that animation. It shows you how they move from one place to, to another. Um, so uh, November, the 5th, December, uh, January, they are all trying to get to the southern part of Serengeti. And in February and March, that's the time they start dropping the babies. So this is the time when you get a lot of babies being born there. But then it goes like that all the round. So you see the white line, that's the international border between uh, uh, Tanzania, our neighbor, uh, Kenya. And the Masai Mara is up there, which is almost a tenth uh, smaller to, to uh, size-wise to Serengeti National Park. And the Serengeti, for your information, is, is almost the size of Connecticut. Um, so this is how it is. So these animals, they move uh, from one place to another uh, because of uh, so the reason uh, food, water, and uh, mating. And the last reason is it's a mother nature makes them to move from one place because there's so many creatures in different places need them, uh, including the soil. You know, um, need them uh, to fertilize the soil. When they eat the grass, they... they, uh, they uh, and then, you know, they manure the soil. But uh, there's so many terrestrial creatures like uh, some crocodiles in the river, uh, pythons, territorial lions, territorial leopards, you know, vultures, uh, decomposers like uh, flies. Uh, they need them. Uh, so they have to move from one place to another. For them, they think they look for the water and food, uh, but at the same time, they feed so many other creatures. At the same time, they lack uh, they will see the blue color, that's a Lake Victoria, which is the second biggest lake in, in the world after Lake Superior. And they need these animals in a way that they, in this river, so many of them kill themselves, as you can see um, in one of the slides I'll show back there. Um, so, so when they're crossing here, um, I mean, they cross the, the, somewhere into the uh, river, so many of them been killing each other. And uh, the dead bodies are taken, you know, by floods uh, to the Lake Victoria in a small little particles. And then in there, guess what? They're fish, 
uh, the crocodiles, which will be eating the fish. So the fish eat the little microscopic little pieces, which are coming from these rivers around here. And then fish will be eaten by crocs or fish will be eaten by people. So enrichment of this lake depends on the survival of the, our national parks. So we, of course, need uh, animal lovers like you and everybody uh, who comes there and helping us. You enjoy at the same time to get a revenue to make these places move. Yeah, so... These are the uh, animals which migrate, actually. We have uh, the world beast, which is the main uh, 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 groups which migrating. Uh, we nickname this uh, uh, spare part animal. It looks like, uh, if you look at their face very close, it looks like a big grasshopper face. And uh, they have, a, uh, on the back, they have like a horse mane and then horse tail, gazelle legs. It's just a little collection. And of course, we got a beautiful zebras. And of course, we have Thompson, this is a grand gazelle. We have grand gazelles and Thompson's gazelles. And we have the elands. So all these ones they do migrating in a different uh, 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 location. But normally zebras and all the beasts sometimes they mixed up together, which we call, we call them complementary feeders because zebras are uh, they have teeth in both jaws, up and lower. So which means they can cut a longer, they can eat the longer grasses. But the wild beasts normally um, goes for the um, shorter grasses because they have a teeth like a cow's and a lower jaws only. So uh, normally zebras, uh, they and the wild beasts go together and then the gazelle fall behind and the elands again fall there. Yeah. So this is June now. Um, June, as you can see, they're all facing one direction and they're all heading to the western parts of Serengeti. And then thousands and thousands of numbers of them. At the same time, the males trying to regroup the females for mating. And uh, it's happened between June and July. And uh, uh, this one is what I was telling you before. Uh, this is a September now, September, October. Uh, that is a, uh, mostly happening when they cross the Mara River uh, or uh, trying to get to the other side for the green pasture. And then and the next day they cross again. So by crossing this number together, like look at this, uh, picture here um so many of them they kill each other more than being killed by crocodiles or you know mostly crocodiles because they uh, stampeding on, the, on themselves and in there there are a lot of uh it's it, there are lot rocks there granite stones so and they hoof animals as you know um so they kill each other and a lot of these dead bodies are pushed all the way to lake victoria and as I said earlier, it goes in a small little particles because when the body is hit, hitting the bank of the river, the rock, the tree on the side of the river, it's becoming a small little pieces and then it goes all the way to Lake Victoria, small little pieces and the creatures they are enjoying. Yeah, so this is again the zebras, they are just enjoying drinking the water. Um, and that's in, uh, you know, one of those uh, small water holes. And you can see those ears, they're very careful watching and listening, very careful. You can see some of them like this one here, the ear, one ear is facing backward and another one forward because they all eat these ears are independent moving. So you can hear from the back if there's any land because close the water is the most dangerous place for them. So if there's anything, they be very careful and you see all those eyes very, being very careful because they know in the water, even the water is very brown colored, they know Mr. Crocodile might be in there. So it's a part of experience. We do that. And uh, this is a massive number of the hippo zebras. As I say, they, oh, we talk about maybe about a million of them. Uh, see the endless uh, plane and uh, uh, June, uh, May, June, it's the best time to, to see the huge number of, of these animals like that. But of course, um, um, the, the giraffes, and you can see the safari vehicle on the other side. That's the kind of the vehicle we're using. I'll show you the closer picture next. Uh, get to see these giraffes. Uh, we don't know how many the giraffes. We got lots of giraffes, and you'll see a lot of them, uh, males and females and the babies and all this kind of thing. Yeah, and uh, this is uh, are the predators, you know, uh, of the Serengeti. We got uh, lions, of course. This was one of the best pictures I took uh, a couple of years back. Uh, this tells you how important to have the proper guide. As I was talking to Eric a couple of days back that uh, you might have the best itinerary in a, you know, the best program, good accommodation, but you need to have the right manpower. This picture tells you that the guide was, you know, one of the good guys. So but what I mean here, early in the morning, and then the, pack, the cow was packed on the right area, so to get this picture, you see the shadow of the animal. So that's the uh, guide's responsibility on car positioning to know that you're getting the good picture. Otherwise, they all tend to be dark. 
yeah, so they these cubs, you know, having great time. See, their bellies are full and life is good. We love them. Yeah, and of course, the other predators are hyenas, um, which are my favorite animals. In you know, in all our carnivores we're having in the wilderness, hyenas are they are not dogs, they're not cats, they just right there by themselves and uh, they play a big role in uh, controlling and uh, you know balancing nature in uh, so many ways uh, because uh, hyenas are considered as internal enemies to human you get with you get them in a, in a closer villages you know farms wherever they are uh, internal enemies to lions so you get them in a savannah internal enemies to pythons so you get them in the jungles so they're everywhere they're everywhere uh, so they play a big role especially in a time when when the wallabies babies are born in February, March, they, you know, trying to, they, for them it's food, but it's part of the controlling the number because if all wallabies survive, that means we'll be ending up with a big number and we'll have to ship some in America, you know, like that. So I love them actually. Uh, cheetahs as well. Uh, this uh, is the mama and the uh, older cubs, they're about two years roughly. And so it's a part of, you know, our carnivals who will be able to see in Serengeti. And this picture, I had to put it so that you can see how close you can get. Of course, the lions and the safari vehicles there. And normally, we open the top and uh, you can sit there and, uh, you know, stand up and enjoy. So we put it, all our vehicles have a canopy on top so, so that you can block the direct sun on you. And uh, each one have a window seat. So you can open your window, take the picture from the window, or you can stand up and enjoy as though, like those people. Okay, so yeah, of course the leopards, see how close you can get it uh, to, to the national park actually. And of course the elephants, um, in one of these national park and the big baobab tree, one of the long living tree in Africa, um, was like right there. And then uh, this is in Tarangara National Park. And of course, this is one of the best pictures. I like it because these guides, when they saw um, the elephants coming, one of the guide back up. All the vehicles have a radio, so like a little antenna in front. So he backed up so that they can let the elephant pass between the trucks. So that's all about guides. Uh, yeah, so get a chance to see. And it's sometimes it's very close. You can even use your cell phone to get that kind of picture. Yeah, the hippos, you know, thousands of hippos. And uh, we normally look at this lady. I remember we we went to this hippo pool and then she didn't want to leave there. Anyway, we normally go to the hippo pool very early in the morning for the better experience. Why early in the morning? Because hippos are active at night. They go grazing at night, looking for the green pasture. And then early in the morning, between 6.30 and 7.30, that's the time they're coming back. See, like that one was coming in. Uh, so when they're coming in, that's the best time to see them coming in and then uh, the males, when they get out, they lose their territory. And when they come back, that's the time they try to fight back to, for the territory. Females, they have no problem. You, they got in and then, you know, any males who's going to show up and have a, a dominancy is going to be the, the owner of that territory. So it goes that way. And uh, we, we normally leave the camp or the lodge barrel in the morning and go to the hippo pool, experience the hippo experience, and then go back to the camp or the lodge having breakfast or brunch. Or my, sometimes we take uh, lunch or breakfast with us. Yeah. And uh, this, is how, this is one of my best picture, you know, getting very close to rhino, um, um, you know, but this is not all the time. But of course, uh, this one, one, one of the best is they get very close and you get to see them very close. You open, as I say, the roof is up there. You can, there's some folks sitting, open the window, you can see whatever you want to see like that. Yeah. And uh, this is another great picture you know um see uh, all the zebras mixed up with the wildebeest and as i told you the complementary feeders they um hang together uh, the why the other reason they stay together because they have the same predators you know hyenas lions cheetahs leopards you name it so they normally alert to each other so if there's any kind of those predators around uh, if the zebra barking or a uh, uh, wildebeest does like a hoo hoo thing, each one knows there's a danger and then trying to move and run away for, for the dear lives. Yeah. And um, you can even use your cell phone to take a picture. You know, those are cheetahs, the same cheetahs I showed you a uh, slideshow before. And you can even you get 
using your cell phone, but I don't mean that you don't need to bring your camera. But this is one of the thing I always tell people that we like you taking pictures as many as you want where you can, but there's a moment we need, we would like you to put down all your electronics and stand up there on the roof and enjoy. You know, that's where you can be able to see as much as you can because the way you see the zebras and wallabies there, the birds there, like uh, pick pickers or grasshopper stickers, and sometimes we'll see a little Thompson gazelle, green gazelle. See those zebras in the world of beasts are kind of uh, each one moving each other way. You might see elephants on a fire, you might see a cheetah, but if you stick taking only pictures, sometimes you miss so much. So there's a moment, you know, you put down your electronics and enjoy the beauty of this park. And this is how we feed you guys. Uh, we feed the feed uh, the fox. So uh, we all the places will be we will be staying. Uh, chefs are well trained and uh, to the international standard. And of course, they know people have different allergies. You know, uh, gluten free or they don't eat nuts. So they have so many different uh, things. So that well, in all information normally will be shared to Santu uh, uh, to, uh, to Eric and then. Uh, uh, will give us the information and then we, we know exactly what how we can deal with it and then provide the good service to the people and uh, just to, to let you know when you come to africa uh, some people think you'll lose weight you don't lose weight you'll be fed well about three meals a day and the all kind of uh, good stuffs as well and this is how we picnic you know if we take like we decided to take the, the all day tour uh, this is our picnic. We take the picnic boxes. We have our chairs and have the lunch in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And then uh, this is uh, the picnic uh, uh, shed, you know, the little tree you call the desert tree. Uh, we sit there and pack the vehicles there and enjoy in the middle of our national park. Yep. So this is how the vehicles look from inside now. you can. This means that uh, you can be able to charge your camera. You see on the further left there. There's a charger there. You can be able to charge your camera, all your small uh, electronics. And then uh, between the seats in the back, there's a cooler, uh, a cool box, so fridge, actually, I can say that. So it's uh, every single morning uh, filled up with the water and for you to drink and like that. And uh, of course, by drinking, you need to go for number one, uh, which is very important. Normally, in every one hour, we normally stop the bathrooms um, in a good bathroom, or, you know, good enough for you to, to use that uh, like that. So it's very important to do that. As I said earlier, cultural experience, that's one of the best thing in all this uh, region of Eastern Africa. Of course, in Tanzania, this one is written 120, but about more than 125 different tribes. But as I said, in Kenya, there are about uh, 43 tribes and in, in Rwanda, the main uh, uh, Rwandese, you know, they all speak the same language. So we get a chance, uh, part of the itinerary, you get a chance to go to the local markets. It's like a farmer's market, but it's a daily market where the locals shop for their own needs. You know, most of the people in our rural areas does not have like, fridges, a uh, fridge in their homes. So, so um, they have to buy daily. You know, buy um, you know, carrots or fish or meat, whatsoever you name it. They got all, all everything there. Sometimes they bring in live goats, uh, chicken, like that. So you got experience in a very authentic way. Uh, go to the market, interact with the locals, hear how they live, and like that. And uh, another experience will be the Maasai villages, you know. Um, and a very authentic, actually. Uh, go inside their huts and see how they live. You know, in you know, in this region and all these tribes, somehow other tribes have, have been somehow westernized. You know, the way we dress, the way we eat. But the Maasai are still living the way they used to. And historically, the Maasai people they're from the southern part of Egypt. They migrated down to northern part of Kenya, and then they came to southern part of Kenya. They entered the uh, northern part of Tanzania. They are all everywhere now into that region. And they're the ones who named Maasai Mara, which means the dotted land. They're the ones who named Serengeti, which means endless plain. They are the ones who named Ngorongoro, which means a cowbell, because they had the cows and they were making a lot of a, a cow bell, Ngorongoro, Ngorongoro. So all those uh, kind of uh, reasons, they are the ones who named into all that region. Even Arusha, where I come from, they're the ones who named that area. So we'll get a chance to go into their village, go inside their huts, um, 
and we'll see and learn how they live, interact with the locals, and then after that we proceed. Yeah, so, and then, oh, we have a school, actually, school visit. Uh, of course, this school is named after me. It's one of the uh, public school, actually, I've done that in terms of education as well, support the locals, because I've been helped to reach where I am. So we open a, a public school uh, in Tanzania and I have two schools. So this one was school uh, named after me. And then I have another school, which is in town. Uh, this is like a private school. So we have two schools. So you get a chance to see how the school system in Tanzania works uh, and uh, go to the public school. This is a public, public school. Uh, mostly 99% of the kids are my size. And then this one, it's in town, um, uh, you know, it's a mixture of all kinds of Tanzania tribes schooling at this school here. So you get a chance to interact with that. So accommodation, actually, um, for accommodation, um, now this is where we're gonna stay, actually. We have all kind. We have from a three star to five or six star, you can put that way. But uh, all these places, the way we make uh, this program together with Eric, um, um, it's in a way that it's gonna be uh, in a very nice way so that you can have a great time. It's, it's, so part of it is the concrete building, part of it it's in uh, um, uh, a tented lodge, especially when we get to Serengeti. And this is what we mean when we sort of talk about camping in Serengeti. It's a glamping, it's a fake camping. Um, see how it looks, this is a tent and you see the animals there, there's giraffes right in front of your tent. Uh, sometimes, uh, like last time I was there, there were even, uh, uh, what is this, elephant, there were lions there. So they come, but they never get inside your tent. And this is how you, the bed look like inside your tent. Um, and then you go down there, this is how it looks from the little beautiful uh, chairs outside there. You can sit out there and then enjoy the beauty of the area, drinking your wine or gin and tonic and you name it. Yeah, so the bathrooms inside the tents, this is how they look like, of course. And of course, this is how it looks out from, uh, from we did a drone shot, you know, to make it more visible. And uh, a part of it, you know, you enjoy the, what is called bush television. You sit outside and there's a beautiful set up uh, 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 fire, you know, campfire and enjoy your evening and have some good stories but with your guide or yourselves and and enjoying the moments of the day you had you know discussing the enjoy um, moment you had in the daytime when you see all those animals yeah and then gorilla trekking this will be next year september I'm very excited about it um in fact uh, uh it's one of the very uh highlights actually people real uh, doing it nowadays accordingly and it's in rwanda of course, there's in two countries, Rwanda and, and Uganda, but we're going to do it in Rwanda, which is much easier and accessible. Um, once you get to Rwanda, you, you, you have like, like one night in Rwanda, and the next day you see a little bit of Rwanda, uh, and then uh, Tigali, sorry, and then from there you drive to uh, Volcano National Park where you do this. So normally trekking of the gorilla is between, uh, let's put it one hour to four hours in between. But uh, as I was we were discussing, which I've done this many times, um, what, uh, what happened is uh, we normally know the, 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 the ability of our people before they go. So there are different families of gorillas, over 16 different families. So the authority will, will assign us uh, the closer uh, uh, gorillas families uh, depends on how we are all feel we are physically fit. And of course, early in the morning before we go for gorilla tracking, they normally send um, the trackers into the bush. And then they have, of course, the walkie-talkie and let the main guide which direction to go so that you can be able to see. So it's a guarantee to see the gorillas and uh, for that area. And of course, this picture was just before COVID. Um, you know, you could just go there without mask. But this one now, it's in a, after COVID, you know, so this was last year uh, in June. So once you get to the gorillas, of course, you have to wear a mask. Yeah. And that's why we prefer to do the gorilla fests. As you'll see that generally, uh, they'll send it to you, folks. Um, go do the gorilla fest and then go for the wildlife in, in Kenya and Tanzania as well. Yeah. So this is how close you can get to gorillas. You can use even your cell phone as this gentleman is doing. Yeah. And uh, the islands, the Zanzibar. 
Um, it's one of the uh, very nice places to go, actually, if you're interested. Uh, most of the people, after they do the safari, maybe the Tanzania program, after you're done with the Tanzania program, the one I've seen getting going or trying to renamed it, uh, you go, you fly to Zanzibar. It's only one hour flight. Get to Zanzibar, you'll be picked up, being taken to beautiful resorts uh, of your choice. And then uh, from there, you can visit a uh, spice farm, uh, Stone Town, which is a uh, uh, world, one of the world heads in sight, beautiful beaches. Uh, and uh, yeah, you could do the sunset uh, uh, cruise, uh, sunset Dow, we call it, and uh, have the great time there. And then after that, you fly back home. So that the uh, the Zanzibar side, it's a bit, uh, for the best time, best, best experience, not minimum uh, than three days. With three to four days, you'll have the best time of it. So speaking of the Zanzibar, this is how the Zanzibar looks like. And, uh, uh, and beautiful beaches, as you can see there. You know, and they have they get all kind of water uh, water spots actually, uh, scuba diving, uh, you know, snorkeling, any there's lot of all kind of activities which they can offer there. Yeah, and uh, uh, the team, as I was telling you, um, you can have everything, but you need to have the the right manpower, and this is part of it. So the guides are everything, well trained. Uh, of course, even this coming uh, uh, April, when I get back home, we'll be having another training in a first AD and uh, flora and fauna and handling the clients. So every year we normally do this training to you know, on job training, you know, uh, to make us ready for the next season. Yeah. And so, yeah. And then uh, that's it. And uh, looking forward for any question and any uh, thing. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Anybody have questions for Lucas today? Okay, well, if you don't have any, um, so I want to thank everybody for joining us. Just as a reminder, we have uh, two departures this year, and I believe we have space on both departures, uh, just one more space on the first departure, which is uh, May 29th of 2024. In the second departure, June tenth of twenty twenty four. May I ask, um, do you need a yellow fever shot to go to Tanzania? Are you 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 don't need to have a yellow fever because uh, you'll be coming directly from our United States. Uh, what I mean here is once you fly from here, maybe to Amsterdam or to any European uh, destination direct to Tanzania, you don't need to have a yellow fever. But if you'll be going through any other African countries, like the next year program of Rwanda and Kenya, you definitely need to have that to go from one country to another. I see. Okay. Um, and what about malaria shots? Yeah, the malaria shots actually is not, you'll, the best way is to see your physician or your doctor and of course you'll be given uh, the pills yeah so the last when i took a group to africa this past year uh, we did take um, the malaria pills um, at a local level in, in tucson or in albuquerque we can go to always recommend going to passport health or seeing your local physician and they can uh, they can prescribe that that for you um, so, as I mentioned, we have a, a May departure this year with one left. We have a uh, two weeks later, we'll go on our second departure with, with Lucas. And then next year, we'll, our Tanzania uh, departure will be May 30th. Um, and our Kenya with the uh, Rwanda gorilla trekking will depart September 3rd. So, if you are interested, these tours will fill quickly. Um, and uh, urge you to get your reservation soon. So let us know. And um, any other questions for Lucas? Yeah, I had a, a quick question about the uh, Tanzania tourist uh, visa that you're supposed to get at the airport. Do you need to do anything ahead of time or can it all be done at the airport real time? I mean, the best way is to do it uh, ahead of time, uh, which will save some time because, you know, once you'll be let, you can get a visa on arrival, but it's going to be hectic for you because once you get there, imagine the plane have like a 300 people and maybe a quarter of them, they don't have a visa and line up for the visa line might spend like another two hours. So once you have your visa, uh, 
uh, ahead of time, that will save some time. And uh, I think Eric, you have the, the link, you can uh, share that link um, for those who need to apply for the visa. That Everything is there electronically. You can pay online and get your document and then boom, you're done. That is correct. Uh, so for uh, everybody who- On that point though, on that point, even though if you fill the form out ahead of time, you still have to pay in cash at, at uh, when you come in, is that true? I, I think you can use a credit card to pay online. It's not about cash. I even okay. in Tanzania, once you get to the Tanzania, if you apply there on arrival, it's not cash. They'll give you a, a what is called a code, and there's a local bank in in the airport where you have to go and deposit the money. So it's not cash. Thank you. You're welcome. So for everybody who's who's joined us on the call, uh, we'll send out this information uh, prior to departure. Um, approximately 90 days prior to departure, we'll send you out a packet to help you get ready, your visa, et cetera. Then at about uh, one month before departure, we'll have a, a tour briefing to help you get ready, further ready uh, for our international group, which of course will be fully escorted from Tucson and, um, and then all the way to uh, Tanzania and back. Okay, so um, this will all be recorded and online for you to view. And if you have any questions, just give us a call at 520-325-8839. We're happy to take your reservation. Thank you very much, Lucas. And thank, thank you, you for joining us today. Looking forward to seeing you in Tanzania. I know. Bye.